Hey everyone, uh, my name is Soham and like Colin said, and I'm here to present on like deep learning with computer vision. And yeah, so let's get started. So I work at ANSYS, just uh, like, you know, quick description about me. And this was like one of the problems like I had, like I'm, I'm taking an online class and this, this was like one of the problems which I was like working on. And I wanted to like just share the approach. So here I am. Uh, so yeah, let's just walk through the, what I'm going to try to do in this, uh, meetup. So the, I think there are like two parts here. So since there are like, uh, the questions at the end, I think I'll go through both the parts because that, that, that was what was promised. So yeah, the first part is basically trying to, uh, like give a quick, like a basic summary of like what deep learning is like from scratch almost as much as I can, and then go to the actual like uh, work which I've done. So I think I'll go with the first part. So it's basically a Jupyter notebook or like a Colab notebook, which I'm just opening right now. And let's see, it's looking a little bit wild, but I think I have it open here, so I might as well go here. Sorry. So yeah, uh, so I'm gonna get started with like, what is a perceptron? Like, I mean, I'm sure you guys have like, uh, gets like you, you get, you guys get like correlated with this analogy of like a human brain and like and a human brain has like neurons, right? So an artificial neuron is basically a perceptron. So that's why I've like given this like image as a starting point. So this is what you see as a, is basically a natural neuron. And then you have like this artificial neuron, which is, I think the slide could be adjusted a little bit. Yeah. So as you can see, I mean, it basically has like input and output and like it's linear algebra going on here. Like you have like a weight, weight like a couple of weights coming in and you're adding them up and there is an output coming in. And the key part here is like the activation function. And we are going to touch on this in like the coming slides, but basically there's some input coming in and there's output going out. So, and this is modeled based on like biology because like uh, it's inspired by like th that neuron, which I just showed. So, uh, like back to the question which I raised, I mean, what is an activation function? I mean, so that like there are like several activation functions and the reason we need an activation function is like if you just add stuff and like keep on adding stuff, I mean, it's, it's just linear, like two plus two is four, right? I mean, if you don't have a uh, non-linearity, I mean, the problem itself is trivial. And I mean, this is like a very high level kind of description, but this is the way I understand it, right? So one of the nonlinear functions which I like use, I've like tried to plot them basically using like matplotlib. So uh, this is basically the plotting code, code if I can scroll through this. Uh, oops. Hmm. I could have adjusted this a little bit earlier, but anyways, yeah, so, uh, Yeah, so I'm just gonna run this code and it's already run, but like essentially it's plotting like a sigmoid and a ReLU function. And that's, I'm just, I'm just, the, what I'm doing, trying to attempt here is like trying to, uh, this is, yeah, give me a moment actually. Uh, is it possible to raise this a little bit? Up? Yeah. a little bit more if possible. I think this is better. Thank you. Okay. This makes it better, I think, at least for me. So, yeah, so I was like just going through the plots here, but, um, Essentially what you're doing is like trying to, I was just trying to show you the activation functions here. And yeah, so these are the plots. Like you have like sigmoid and ReLU and like uh, ReLU is like more commonly used activation function and sigmoid is like 
it has issues and I'm going to discuss the issues in the next kind of slide here. So if I go here, I mean, yeah, so sigmoids have like, as you can see, I mean, they are not, uh, yeah. Uh, they're not zero centered and they have like, they kill, they, they saturate and kill gradients. So I'm gonna to try to go through a demo. Basically, like what I've tried to do here is like start with a, this intro stuff was like, I added it later. So that's why I'm like a little bit disorganized as you can see. But yeah, I'm gonna to try to uh, run through some code. Maybe that will help the things here. So yeah, here basically what I'm doing here is like a typical machine learning setup where I'm trying to, uh, trying to get some trait, there's the original training data and I'm running it through a classifier which will basically attempt to classify what the image is. And so if you look at this, you have like, you know, 60,000 examples. You run it through a MLP, that is a multi-layer perceptron. We discussed the perce perceptron. Here, this is like a bunch of multiple layers of perceptron. So it's like expanding on that concept, basically. So you call a fit, and that's like a usual SKLearn thing where you fit the model, basically. So yeah, the, the point here I'm trying to, this is like an intro to kind of thing but that's why I'm like running through it a little bit more faster, but yeah, I'm basically running this code. And what it's doing is, it's taking a like while to run, but still running yeah it's running now that's good promising yeah so as you can see uh, it's like basically doing training over like a bunch of rounds and like iterations are basically the rounds and as you can notice like the loss function is like the value is like going down and down so you're trying to decrease the loss that's the whole point of this exercise uh, so yeah I mean and you can see like it trained and it has an accuracy of like 98% like if you multiply by multiplied by 100 right so yeah, that's pretty much what it is doing. It's training and these are like the images which, it, which are showing up, right? So yeah, I think, th I think that's like a good starting point, I guess. But yeah, uh, I think the next kind of topic is like neural networks. So if we have like, we start with perceptrons, we, we looked at like MLP, and then we are like, w once we start combining these building blocks, we get like a neural network. And then when you have like a, the only addition, additional thing which is going on here is like, you are adding like bunch of layers here. And that's why it's like called a neural network. So it's already neurons, but you have a network of neurons basically. So now I'll come to the actual, like I'm going closer to the actual stuff which I wanted to present in the first place. So a convolutional network, a neural network is like, it is even building on on the neural network. So you, when you talk about like con nets, usually you have like a, a lot of depth and a lot of like parameters to tune. Essentially, the ones which we saw right now, they have like relatively less number of parameters because the number of neurons are less. So now I think I'll go to the actual presentation, which I'm more confident in like presenting because that's what I did. So, uh, yeah. I can adjust this again a little bit. Yeah. So now this is what I did actually. So I have a data set, like again, it's the same analogy. You have some training data and then you want to classify image, uh, classify, it's a classification problem and a detection problem. So if you have an image and you want to see like, you know, uh, what are the digits in that image? That was the problem which I was trying to solve, right? So I had to start with some training data. And in this case, what I did is like, Street house, uh, street view house numbers. It's basically Google has like street view images. So they recorded like images with uh, what? Street numbers. And that is like my input data. And uh, what, what you can like even look at the, I have I think a photo with like, you know, the samples here. So as you can see, like it's like images with like numbers basically. And Google is like two formats in this case. Like one format has like actual uh, uncropped images 
which is like a little bit harder and there are like cropped images the only thing with the cropped images is like a little bit it's even more easier because it's like 30 by 32 by 32 and you can just train on literally the digits like you see the boxes like you can just train on the boxes so it's pretty easier like if you see a two it has to be a two i mean there's no disturbance there so yeah so i clearly picked the second format because it was pretty straightforward to train on that format because you you all you have is digits the only constraint is now you have to make sure that your input is always like a 32 by 32 image otherwise you cannot do this so that's the only constraint when you train on like a fixed size kind of thing so yeah we talked about the data set now i think i'm going to talk about the like the tools which i used and like these are like yeah i didn't have to do anything from scratch so because we have like libraries doing this so there's like this tensorflow and there's like chaos so both of them are open source and i have like put in the links as well so you guys you guys can take a look but essentially what it is is like uh, tensorflow has like support for like languages like python and c++ and it it, it is basically a one of the good tools you, you can use for like, there are others, but you can, it's one of the good tools to use for like deep learning. I, I would definitely recommend it. So what I did is like, I used Keras inside that TensorFlow uh, namespace. Keras is basically like a top level thing and like uh, TensorFlow is like sits on the bottom kind of uh, thing. So it's more, much more closer to the hardware and stuff. And it's TensorFlow, uh, Keras can give you like more abstracted and more easy to use kind of API and TensorFlow does the actual hard work. That's like a very high level way of putting, uh, putting this uh, tools kind of uh, slide into perspective basically. So, so I think next I'm gonna go to the, I think I covered most of the things here. So what I did is like, again, this was off the shelf, but uh, it turns out like TensorFlow has like, uh, and like Keras, even these guys have like bunch of like, they have, uh, given out like models which you can just use for like deep learning and these models are like people have like trained the data uh trained the model on like a huge database like imagenet like imagenet has like 14 million images so you train your model on a huge data set and then you have a model which you can use for other stuff so that's what i'm going to discuss further but yeah essentially this vgg16 is one of the models which i used and what I'm, what I'm doing is basically image detection, right? I mean, image classification. So you have an image and you want to know, that's the input, and you want to know like what it is. And in my case, I'm just looking at digits. So just to make it simpler, I think. So yeah, so like I discussed, I mean, uh, this VGG16, the 16 in the name is like the depth. And that's why it has like 16 like fully connected layers. And like, just to give you a analogy here, I mean, you see, this is like a dense kind of fully connected layer uh, stuff going on here because all of these are like, you know, connected to every other, you know, next layer. So that's why it's like uh, fully connected. So the other things which are going on is like pooling and stuff, which I'm going to give an example. But uh, yeah, I think the key thing here is like, because you have like so many neurons to train here, the number of parameters is like 14 million, which is, oh, sorry, 140 million. And I'm going to come to that in a second. So what I'm doing in this slide is, if I can run this again. Right, so it's like, it's downloading the data for the model and it's, it's going to give us the summary of how the model looks like basically. So as you can see, the output, like I said, so here, I mean, the challenge here is, I mean, is that you have like an input of like a shape of like 224 by 224 by three, and three is like RGB, like the three image uh, channels, right? So my data set was like cropped, like it had like 32 by 32 uh, input size. So you can actually play around with this and like, uh, when you call VGG16, there is an argument which you can put and like you can make sure that your input shape is like 32 by 32. So you can get around this. But here I'm just trying to, for demonstration purposes, I'm like going with the default kind of setting. Uh, and it also helps my demo example. But yeah, essentially you have like an input layer and then you have like a lot of fully connected layers, which are like convex basically. 
So yeah, as you can see, I mean, pooling also is like shown here. I mean, you have like pooling, what, what basically it does is like it splits the size, like it divides it by two. Like if you see 224, it's dividing into half basically. So it's like making the con net, uh, like what do you call the 2D size into like half basically. So, and why would you do that? I mean, it's, it's less memory intensive and the number of parameters also in theory should like reduce down. But yeah, these are like one of some of the like technical terms which are there in that. But uh, so if I just look, go down and like look at the parameters, like, like I said, I mean, it has like 140 million parameters, which is like a lot. Uh, and all of them are trainable. And there is like this thing called like non-trainable. So this is like, if you can, if you freeze some layers, then you can say, hey, I don't want to train on these layers. Then it makes your life easier. Like maybe you, instead of 140 million, you, you just want to train on like at like 50,000 parameters because you might not have the same data as ImageNet. ImageNet has like 14 million images. And like in my case, I had like, I think 70K or like, like I think uh, 100K images, which is like very, very small as compared to like 14 million. So for small data sets, you can like actually try to freeze the model and stuff. So yeah, it's basically, it's convenient to have this library. Uh, so let's try to see VGG scene in action. So basically this is a simple kind of example, but what it is doing is like, it's taking in an image and it's trying, to, we are just using this model and seeing if it can classify stuff. So, and let me just show you the image. So I think I'm using this Tusker thing, which is basically an elephant, but you open this I think at one. <laughs> Why is this not opening? Hmm. Okay, let me try this. This should open. Whoa, this is a huge long slide. Okay, I'm just trying to open this to see, show you guys what is the input. This is the, yeah, so this is the input, like, I mean, this is the elephant image. And this model obviously doesn't know about it. And we are asking the model, like, you know, what's, what this is. So it has obviously been trained on, like, one of, one of the classes which it was trained on is an elephant. But let's try to see what happens. So yeah, if I walk through the code, I mean, yeah, I'm like importing stuff for like from Keras and like, you know, load images and like some pre-processing stuff, like converting the image to array. And, but essentially at the end, I'm just going to call, uh, I'm just going to call the uh, prediction method to like, you know, tell me what it is, uh, what the image is basically. So I think I I run this. So yeah, like it's like you, you can see, I mean, it is predicting that it's like a Tusker, which is like with a 43.87% probability. But you can clearly see, I mean, it is, now in this case, I mean, there is an elephant, but there is some background stuff and all. So, I mean, that also kind of plays in, like if, if the image is like a crystal clear and there's like just a single digit or something, the accuracy might be higher. So it all depends on like the input and where, where the model was trained on and that kind of stuff. So. Now I think I'll go to the, the what I did with VGG16. So I first, I think I started with VGG16, then I tried to play around with it. And then now I'm actually gonna use it for some, uh, some application, right? So, uh, so what I'm do, trying to do here is like, I'm applying like transfer learning, which is essentially you have, and I, I think I already talk, talked about this, but you have like a, you have a model which has been trained on like a couple of parameters, but it might not always work for you. Like, I mean, you might have a different problem to solve or you might not have the data for the problem you're solving. So you try to take advantage of what somebody else has already done. Like they have trained this data over like maybe two weeks or something. And uh, you're trying to use that concept for your own stuff. So, um, 
yeah so essentially what is transfer learning i mean it is basically like you want to you have a, a model and you want to use it you want to train the parameters for your own example kind of thing so and this is pretty much what i did like i had uh, i had like three options to do in this case and uh, i'm going to discuss them soon but uh, yeah you have like here i'm discussing like four options but like in this chart but what you're essentially doing is like based on the size of the data set you want to tune the parameters uh, accordingly right i mean like if you have a lot of data sure i mean you can train the whole network because you have like a lot of data but nobody clearly has that so usually what people do is like fine tune the model like you know lower layers of the model and by lower layers i mean like um, but not, sorry i meant like uh, at least the cl output class right i mean you have an input you have an output right so when you look at a neural network i mean sometimes there are like uh, the output of ImageNet might not suit your case. Like if you have, like image set, let's say ImageNet is only doing like animals and you want to do digits, it's probably not going to work because it's only trained on animals. So you want to, you have to at least change the last output class classifier to, to be digits instead of like animals because it's totally useless if it's animals in your case. So yeah, that's pretty much what transfer learning is. Like you transfer, like, you know, you keep the relevant part and you throw away the, or retrain the not relevant part. So, yeah, so like I'm, I'm, I think I'm just trying to compare here. Like these are like, what I did in my project is I tried to train from scratch. Like I started with random weights. Like I have no idea what, what, uh, what the weights actually look like. That is one way. The other way is like, just use the pre-trained model directly. And the third one is like, you know, try to get an idea of how this network works or like, play around with like the layers and try to understand like, you know, can you be, maybe can you do even better than VGG? So yeah, these are the, like the approaches I tried, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, so now I'm going to go through the classification pl pipeline. Like I discussed, I think the basics about this, but uh, yeah, this is pretty much what I did. Look, so, so you have like positive images, you have negative images and that kind of creates your training data. And by like negative images, I mean, like, I mean, Initially, I was like just doing like zero to nine digits, right? I mean, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But as you can see, I think in the, I think I showed you the images. What usually happens is like the image resolution 32 by 32 is low. So it is not very clear. There's like noise and all that stuff going on. So you, you have to train on negative data. Otherwise, what ends up happening is like you are training on like, uh, training on a lot of data, but it's like, you know, you're asking like, hey, is it a digit? Is it a digit? And you're like, your data set is like all digits. So anything it shows, anything you show it to him, uh, that classifier, it's like, it's a digit. So that, that's obviously not going to work because uh, it needs to have like, it needs to be able to discern between what is a digit and what is not a digit. So you need a negative example. Otherwise it's just going to blindly guess and get lucky all the time. So that's the whole point. So this negative data is interesting. So what I did is like, the surrounding area outside of the images, like outside of the digits was like used as negative data because that's not a digit. So that was critical to improve the accuracy basically. So that's why I did that just to give you a context. But yeah, essentially you start with training data like any other machine learning problem. And you, I, I just tried it on three models and then you just pick the best model, right? And I think I've tried to discuss like the parameters like learning rate, optimizer or like a classifier. So softmax is like, if you have like a multi-class classification problem, like, you know, you want to discuss, uh, like you want to classify your images into like, uh, sorry, you want to classify your, yeah, you want to classify your image into like particular classes. It could be just a binary classification, like just two classes. But if it's like multiple classes, then you use and end up using like softmax, which is like 10 classes. So that's pretty much what uh, this, and this really looks really pretty, I mean, sure, but like, I think the key here is to understand that like the parameters which you see here, I mean, they are not intuitive or nobody's going to tell you them. Like, you know, you have to kind of figure them out. You have to try. It's a lot of trial and error and tuning. And that's how you kind of uh, get the answer. So I think that was the whole point of this exercise. But uh, yeah, I think that covers more or less the things uh, which I wanted to cover. But now I think I, we can finally go we are like almost near to the results here, but uh, yeah.
so now detection right so one part is classification like you know hey this is an image is this a digit or not a digit is this a dog or a cat right now detection is like the another part because now i did train it on like a 32 by 32 image but the uh, actual image which i am like predicting on that might not be 32 by 32 so what i ended up doing is like for de detection you just what there are many approaches here and I, I can clearly do better than this but uh what i did is like i went with a 32 by 32 constraint and i was like doing a sliding window like you slide a 32 by 32 window over the whole image and see if there's a digit so it's obviously not very performant but it works like brute force has to work i mean it does work so yeah so that's pretty much what i'm showing in this like uh image here like you have an input image you do some pre-processing maybe i mean you try to get rid of the noise or something and then you just do your sliding window you call predict on the model you already trained on and what what en ends up happening is like when you're like sliding your window what could happen is like you could have like a one and like a little bit of a one and then a one and a two so you what you want to do is like you want to combine all all those things and like because it's still a one like a half of one is still a one so you the box might like you want to make sure that all of them all the boxes you get you want to combine them that's basically non-maximal suppression you want to keep the most uh, the the best box that's the be uh, one way to put it right so and all these are like tools which you you just have to figure out but because because somebody else has already done the hard work of like giving you this library but you have to know how to use it and like know the ins and outs of it like anything else right so yeah uh so now i think we can finally go to the results so yeah results i tried to put it put them in a slide because i couldn't get the images figured out in this colab notebook but yeah so now i think if i uh present maybe it's easier to see a little bit yeah so like how when i showed you the classification pipeline i had to like pick one of the models as in the project basically so the fo the one on the left is like you know i tried it on a model which was like i cr created from scratch which was i mean you can look at the accuracy my own architecture accuracy had like a test accuracy of like 91.54 which is lesser than the other ones but that was a good attempt i guess but yeah so all the three plots have like similar graphs but the takeaway here is like the VGG with the pre-trained weights, like what was already provided to me. I mean, that already gave me a very good accuracy, right? And when, and just to be clear here, when I say pre-trained weights, so I did have to, what I did have to do is like, uh, I did load the pre-trained weights, the weights were there, but I had to still do a little bit of tuning at the last layers because what ImageNet was solving was like, it was solving for like, like animals or something it was not doing digits so you, you had to get rid of the last and that's what they call like the top layers you had to change them to suit your case in my case i had just 10 classes i was still using softmax but i had to make sure that i was doing digits so there was some tuning i mean but i was not starting like with random weights like you know the second one is like random weights you have no idea where you are and you have to train all the way so as and another, another thing which is worth noting the graph for the scratch one it's like a little bit bumpy right because it's trying to figure itself out and then it's like finally there so this one like the pre-trained one it's like already starting at a high accuracy you can see like 95 percent. so it's already doing like really well because somebody spent two weeks on like training this model so it's obviously very good but i didn't know that from the starting so but yeah so these are the results so like the first one is like a little bit rotated frame and it's still able to detect the other one, the one in the middle, there's, it's detecting a three for some reason in the middle. So it's clearly not perfect, I mean, and there's obviously room for improvement, but it's doing something. I mean, it is going through the image and it's trying to find uh, the right output. And it doesn't take too much time. Like, I mean, you just run it. You, the, I think the key part is like training the model. Once you train the model and once you save the model, then you can just predict it easily. Training part is the painful part, but once it's trained, then the prediction step doesn't take too much time. But uh, yeah, I think this is pretty much it. And this is like, I think on the right side is a horrible result, I guess, because I mean, see, I mean, it's, it's a mess here because I think it's, it's a difficult image. The other ones were like a little bit more easier to look at. That's why uh, I was maybe getting lucky, but yeah, I, the, 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 the project which I was working on didn't have the, 
I, yeah, I didn't have to get it to production basically. So it was just get the basics working. So I didn't have to go all the way, but clearly there is more room for improvement. And there is, in fact, even and we could discuss this separately as well, but there is like more, way, uh, more better ways of doing it. Like you can use YOLO, like that's like you look only once. There are like much, much better ways of doing it, but like this kind of get gave me the insight of like w uh, learning about like deep learning and stuff. So yeah, I think this is pretty much what I have. And I have shared like resources as well in the last slide, if you want to take a look, but yeah, this is pretty much what I have.